but he wanted to know what I had come up with. And I was able to share with him that we found a Bible that was on board the ship that washed ashore off Chilmar, that we were in Aquinnah, and we found a cabinet that had been built by um, Wampanoag uh, Native Americans, and they built it out of the planks that were on the ship. And I talked about other things, the bell that was off the ship that was supposedly uh, put in the school on Lambert's Cove Road, and I didn't know where the school was, and I had to find somebody, another person in her early 90s, who knew where the school was and where the bell had been and so forth. So there's a lot of interest in, with certain people about the shipwreck and about what happened and why it happened and so forth. So that sort of is the background of how I got into this that uh, a number of people are interested in it, and you're a witness to that tonight because all of you are here for some reason because you're interested in something about the shipwreck, or interested in me, whatever that is. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's sort of the background on how people are interested in it. Some people have asked me how I got into writing this specific book, and the first thing is that I have written three other books for the History Press. I did. Uh, Mystery on the Vineyard came out in 2008 about a murder that took place right here in Oak Bluffs in 1940 and it was never solved. I wrote about African Americans on Martha's Vineyard and I wrote about the Wampanoags on it, um, Martha's Vineyard. And so I, History Press asked me if I wanted to do another book and whenever anyone asks me to do something I want to accommodate and so this sounded like a good opportunity. Um, the last book, the one on the Wampanoags, is a story that really goes back 10,000 years. And it took me a while to sort of get my hands around something that big. 10,000 years is a long time, and I had to compress it into 200 pages. So I wanted something that was a little briefer. Unfortunately, the city of Columbus hit a rock and went down in 20 minutes. So this story that we're going to talk about tonight is very short and sharp and not sweet at all. It's very um, disastrous, and it happened because of, um, well, we'll get into that. But it was a short story as far as the actual wreck happened. So 20 minutes, basically, and everything was all over. So the actual impetus behind this um, was that I um, worked with a fellow named John Huff, who lives on uh, Indian Hill Road in West Tisbury. I was in a writing group with him a few years ago, and he likes to ride his buck, bike, and I like to drive my bus, and every so often we meet at the top of Indian Hill. And he came to me one day and he said, Tom, you should write a book about the city of Columbus. And I thought that was kind of an interesting thing for him to say, because his grandfather actually wrote a book about the city of Columbus. He wrote a book called Disaster on Devil's Bridge, which is, was written in 1963, and it tells the story of what happened to the city of Columbus from 50 years ago, that perspective. And I found, I thought, if John wants me to do it and thinks I can do a, a better job than his grandfather, that says something. I don't, I don't know that I could do a better job than his grandfather, but I said I would try. So anyway, that was the impetus to, to do the book. I talked to the History Press and they said go for it. So last September I started to, to look into shipwrecks and look into specifically what happened with the city of Columbus. Um, some of you know a little bit about shipwrecks around the vineyard, and I'm, I'm just going to talk about a couple of them so that you have some perspective that um, this wasn't the only shipwreck. If you've been to the Martha's Vineyard Museum shipwreck exhibit, you know that there's dozen, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of shipwrecks all around the vineyard over the years. But three of them come to mind that um, are sort of of special interest. One it happened in 1910, about 100 years ago, it was the Murdy B. Crawley that was, that was a six-masted schooner, which is kind of cool when you think six masts and this boat is going along. And it was filled with coal, and it um, went aground on Boy Street, 1910, and nobody was drowned, but they lost the cargo of coal. But it was just a big, disastrous shipwreck that happened right off the vineyard. Another one happened right off of here on East Chubb, in 1916, the Port Hunter went down, and that was a boat that was filled with war supplies. They were going over to Europe for World War I, and they were told to go around the vineyard and <coughs> then over to, to Europe. And this was to avoid German submarines. And so they're going around East Chubb, 
and a tugboat was coming around West Shop, and the tugboat was headed right toward the Fort Hunter, and they, they played a game of chicken without playing chicken. They intentionally, they each thought the other boat was going to turn away, and the tugboat ran right into the Fort Hunter and sank it and lost all the war supplies, and people, people were saved, the crew were saved, but it was a disaster. The ship is still up here, and people can go diving for it and pick up stuff, and it's, it's a, just another little bit of history that's, that happened right around here. Then uh, another uh, shipwreck that was kind of interesting was in 1992, not that long ago, 20 years ago, off of Cuttyhunk when the Queen Elizabeth II was, was going through Vineyard Sound, went just past Cuttyhunk, and ran aground or ran over a rock and pulled a great big hole in the hull, and everybody had to be evacuated, and they were all upset about that, and justifiably so. The thing was, the boat was in appropriately deep water, everybody thought. It wasn't that there was a rock there that shouldn't have been there, it was that they the boat was actually going too fast, and they had some, they have something called the squat effect, which means that the boat was going so fast it actually sunk lower than it's supposed to in the water and scraped across this rock, and that was really what what caused it. And uh, I think it was your brother that went down and went diving to find the rock that had the paint from the Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> so I think that's kind of interesting that um, how that story comes together. So anyway, those are three shipwrecks. There's dozens and dozens of others that happened around here. But the one we're going to talk about tonight is the city of Columbus. And this is the most disastrous shipwreck on vineyard, in vineyard waters. It happened uh, in the winter of 1884, in January 1884. And there's three parts to this story that I want to talk about. First is the roof, then it's the wreck, and then it's the rescue. So we're going to talk about the roof because that's very important to understand what was happening and why it was so sort of normal for this ship to be where it was at the time that it was. Then we'll talk about the wreck itself. And I gave a little talk last night at, a, a, at the Chilmark Library. And when I finished that part of the talk about the wreck, it was like this, this heavy pall or heavy sadness that just hung down over the, the group, and I just, I don't want to leave you with that sadness, but that's, you know, it's not a pleasant scene. There were a hundred people drowned, and it was, it was a real disaster. But there was a, a, a little bit of bright spot to the story, and that's what we'll talk about with the rescue, because some people were rescued, and they were rescued by people from right here on Martha's Vineyard, the Wampanoag uh, group of hu the Humane Society participated in it, and that was, that was the one saving grace or the one positive thing that happened in the story. So we're going to talk first about the roof. And um, someone suggested I should have a map here, but I'm not big on audiovisual things. So you have to use your imagination on how this works. But uh, the regular route for the city of Columbus was, a, was to leave Boston and go around Cape Cod, because there was no Cape Cod Canal, and then go through Vineyard Sound and then go all the way down to Savannah, Georgia. And the whole point of this was that the steamship line, which had been running since the Civil War, was really designed to bring cotton from the south up north to the mills in the Merrimack Valley and use that, use the cotton and, and mill it and weave it and all sorts of good things like that. So it was really a, a transportation of commerce that started this steamship company. It was a regular operation that happened day in and day out. They were running steamships all the time. It was just like our airplane service now, that you can book a flight from here to there. You know that it goes at a certain time, and it'll get there at a certain time. It was a very usual thing for people to get in their boats, in the, into the boat, and go south or come north, depending on how they wanted to do it. Um, so the, the route was pretty routine. It was something that people were used to over the years. And that's what made this whole wreck such a disaster. <coughs> was that nobody expected anything unusual to happen. You got on the boat in Boston. You got off the boat in Savannah. It took you three days to get there, but that was the routine way to do it. So what I'm going to do is read a little bit from the section that I wrote about the route and give you an idea of what it's all about. Uh, 
cards and the glasses, but that's part of the aging process, I guess. Okay, Cotton Connected, Boston and Savannah. Prior to the Civil War, sailing ships transported cotton north to the New England mills, where it was spun into thread and woven into cloth. Following the war, steamers were utilized to carry cotton. To utilize the return trip headed south, the, the steamship company shipped fish and bacon and, quote, immense quantities of potatoes and apples are also taken out. These are, this is products from the north that's going south. In addition, quote, great numbers of pianos, organs, carriages, etc., are also taken out by these steamers, quote. Clearly, steamships proved an efficient means of cargo transfer, and the voyage was accomplished in three days, which is half the time that it took to go by train. Plus, these boats were much, much bigger than any train. They had, they had, a, um, they could hold something like 4,400 bales of cotton. The hull, the uh, hold of the city of Columbus was 20, more than 20 feet deep, so it could really pile tons and tons of stuff in there. In addition to cotton, turpentine was brought north. End quote. Lumber once brought in sailing ships by slow and laborious process may now be telegraphed for at the mills in Georgia and fine yellow pine cargoes be landed in Boston within six days thereafter. Quote. Transportation expanded, and then immense quantities of early vegetables are thus shipped in excellent condition to Boston, with melons and oranges reaching New England, economic opportunity flourished. And the, the article that I'm quoting here concluded, and thus the two sections, north and south, minister to the wants of each other. So the, the story basically is that that this was a, a means of connecting the North and the South after the Civil War in the era of Reconstruction, and the steamship company was a good way to make money and also to bring the product to where it was needed. So the South was sending up the cotton and the wood and the turpentine, and the North was sending down the apples and the, and the pianos and the, the carriages and so forth. So it was really linking the two together. Now, once the, the commerce was established, then people got into riding the boat as passengers. And the city of Columbus was built in 1878, after about 10 years after this old route had been established. So passengers were now considered part of the cargo or part of the, the use of the, the boat to go north and south. And so they had uh, room enough on the city of Columbus for 200 passengers. So it was a good sized boat. It had three decks and then the hold underneath. If you um, want to imagine how big the ship is, it was 20 feet longer than the island home. You know how big the island home is? Well, this was 20 feet longer. It was 275 feet long. It was narrower, though. It was only like 40 feet wide. So it was like a long, narrow steamship. It had twin propellers, and it moved along about 10 or 12 knots an hour. And it was fueled by coal, so it had a whole lot of weight in it with the coal but then as they burned the coal, the boat would get lighter and lighter, and then it could skim across the water a little bit and get to where it was going a little faster. So um, the ship was built, as I said, in 1878. It was originally designed for a route from New York to Savannah and back and forth that way. And then in 1882, the company was sold to a fellow in Boston, and he included the, or he made it a Boston to Savannah route, and New York was not part of the route then. So it was a Boston to Savannah route. Uh, every two weeks, the boat would leave Boston. There were actually two boats. The, there was one called the Gate City, and then this one was the City of Columbus. And it was originally a southern uh, company set up in Savannah, and Columbus is one of the cities in Georgia. So it was the city of Columbus was named for the Georgia city. When I first got into this, I thought, well, what are they naming a boat world from Ohio for? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. But it was uh, Savannah was the, was the headquarters. It was the city of Macon. Macon, Georgia was another um, one of the boats. They had like four of them that were very similar in size, and they would, they would go the same route back and forth. So that tells you a little bit of what the route was. And the basic routine, as I said, is that they would just have the boats going back and forth. And people who wanted to book a, a ride on it would just get their tickets. Some, some people got it last minute, some people planned ahead, but I mean, it, that was, it was a routine thing. Now, what we're gonna talk about next is the wreck. And that's the thing that, that just was so 
abnormal, so out of the ordinary, so unusual, because there was no storm that night, there was no mechanical difficulty, it was just pilot error that caused this wreck. And you just have to think of it, human error, one person or a couple of people not doing what they were supposed to do brought a real disaster to our shores. What happened was they, the boat left at its usual time, which was 3.30 in the afternoon of um, Thursday, Friday, uh, Thursday, um, January 8th, 17th. It left Boston, it was uh, an hour before it was getting dark because it's middle of winter, shortest days of the year, and it, uh, the captain steered it out of Boston Harbor around Cape Cod, and if you think about the time, it goes only 12 knots an hour, it takes a long time to go out around the Cape and down along the shore, around Monomoy Point, and then coming into Vineyard Sound. And you just have to think that that's taking about 10 hours to get that far. Came into Vineyard Sound, could see uh, West Shop Light on the left, on the port, and Nobska Light on the starboard, and the captain was still steaming it, and came into fully into the sound and could pick up tarpaulin light, and he knew that um, Cutty Hunk was ahead, and there was a, a light ship, <coughs> so, uh, what is it, Salon Pig's light ship was off Cutty Hunk, but at this time, the light ship had, two weeks before, it had broken its uh, mooring, and it had uh, drifted away, and they had to take it up to another harbor, so it was out of commission at the time, but that didn't really have any impact on the wreck, it just is a is sort of an incidental story that there was something else that was going on. But anyway, the captain, around um, 2 o'clock in the morning, he had been steaming along for like 11 hours. It was cold, it was like freezing temperatures. He was out on the deck for a lot of that time, most of that time. And he said, well, I'm, I've been going this long. We're practically out into the open water, and we're going to be steaming right down to Savannah. I can take a break. And he thought it was time to go into the his little state room and, and lie down. But he didn't lie down, he sat on the floor, he leaned his back up against this pipe that had steam heat coming from below. Um, he probably did go to sleep because he was there for a longer time than, than he admitted later. But um, anyway, he put his second mate in charge. His second mate was uh, a fellow from the Cape. He was 21 years old, his name was Gus Harding. And he was not a licensed pilot, but he was a capable seaman. He was in charge, and they had a fellow at the wheel, and they had a lookout. So they had three people that were awake and alert, supposedly, and they were steaming along, and they went past Tarplin Light, the captain's in his stateroom, and they're steaming along, and steaming along, and the, the guy at the wheel looks up, and he sees the Gatehead Lighthouse. And he says to himself, or he said later, that he said to himself, that light looks awfully close. <laughs> but he didn't think what it really meant. And he's coming down, and just as he gets past Cutty Hunk, the wind starts to pick up, because there's, there's a straight line from Buzzards Bay, from over by New Bedford, the wind blows right across. The longer the wind blows, the higher the power is, the longer the fetch. The fetch is the, the way the wind blows across open water. So there's more wind coming across, the tide, as Mr. Goodell knows, comes up and around and actually goes north when you would think it would be going west as it's ebbing, as it's going out. So he's got the tide going against him and actually pushing him toward the vineyard shores. And basically what happened is the ship came right close to the vineyard <coughs> and went within half a mile of the shore, which is very close for a big boat to go. Nobody realized there was anything wrong until they were right on top of a buoy that marked the Devil's Bridge, and that's when the ship just went right onto this rock, and it's an underwater boulder. I'm guessing that it's part of the terminal moraine, which runs down the whole uh, left, the western spine of the vineyard, and just goes out into the water. It's a submerged rock, and the ship just ran up on it, and just stopped. And there was a guy down below who was shoveling coal into the into the boiler to get the to the furnace to get the boiler going, and he just noticed, he knew something was wrong right away, because the ship stopped. The ship doesn't stop in the middle of the, the transport like that, unless you know what you're doing. So it couldn't go any farther forward. The captain woke up, got out, and said, 
you've got to go to fourth, turn to fourth. And they started to go to fourth. They couldn't, didn't have any power. He couldn't do that. Then he said, let's re reverse engines, try to get off, because he realized something was wrong. He put the engines in reverse, and that basically ripped a hole in the bow, and the ship started to take on water. Then it was out in the middle of the sound, and the wind was coming so hard, it started to blow the ship a little bit sideways. Well, the captain thought, I better get a sail up. This boat had two, two masts, and he put the sails up, sort of, and the sails were sort of like a lobster boat sails so that they get a, a little bit of stamina and straightness so that they could um, try to get themselves off this rock. So they put the sails up, but they didn't really do anything, and the ship started to, to turn more so that it was almost broadside to the, to the wind that was coming. And the ship, the captain knew that, some, that he was stuck then. He knew he couldn't uh, get off the rock, he couldn't go forward, he couldn't go back, they'd have to abandon the ship. Now it's 3.30 in the morning, 3.30 in the morning, just think of that where you are at 3.30 in the morning, you're totally out of it. And people heard this, that they heard that there was, there was grinding of the boat on the rocks, they didn't know what was going to happen, they were, they were all sort of panic stricken. The captain went down below and he said, you have to put on your life jackets, he said to the passengers, you have to put on your life jackets, we have to abandon the ship. He didn't really order the lifeboats to go down. He didn't tell other people to get the passengers going. He was just taking care of one person at a time. Now, there were 87 passengers. That's a lot of people. And the, the 30 of them were women and children. And as this catastrophe unfolded, and as I said at the beginning, it only took about 20 minutes for the whole thing to happen, the waves started to wash in over the top of the, the boat. And basically, as people were coming up from their staterooms to try to find out how to abandon ship, they came up the gangway and, and were washed right into the water. And the water was probably 35 degrees, maybe 40 degrees. And the people couldn't, many of them couldn't swim. They were counting on these life jackets, which were made of cork and not really all that great. And you can't, you can't survive in that kind of temperature and without, for any length of time. And so groups of people would be coming up, and these are mothers and children, and husbands and wives, and uh, several older people that, that just everybody was just in a, in a state of panic, and it just washed people overboard, and it was just a very frightening experience. And the boat then sank further and further into the water, so you couldn't go back to your stateroom. I mean, the boat was going lower and lower, and all that was sticking out was the bow toward, at the end of this 20-minute episode. And a couple of, and the two masks were sticking up. And they did manage to, to get a couple of lifeboats off, and a, a few people were saved that way by just jumping in lifeboats. But the majority of people were just washed off the, the deck of the ship and drowned. And 103 people died in that experience. And it was just, just frightening. Um, so that's, that's the wreck, that's what it's all about. That's why the story is as such a, a, a dismal, sad, disastrous feel to it, is that 100 people who are sound asleep and totally confident that everything is under control, they lost their lives. And there were two, there were two families, I go into, in the, in the book, I go into some detail about, uh, there were two families that each had five people in them, so that was, you know, those families were just wiped out, husband and wife here, mother and child over here. I mean, it was, it was really horrible. So, yeah. Can you give us a sense of where she ran around? Um, if you go to Gay Head, to the lighthouse, and you look out toward Cuddy Hunt, that's where Devil's Bridge is. It's about a half mile offshore. They had three <coughs> miles where the boat could have been. That's how wide the sound is there. They had plenty of room. But it was, it was far enough offshore that you couldn't just get off the boat and, and swim, but it was relatively close. And that's where the next part of the story takes place, is that the rescue was, was taken by the Wampanoags, who were members of the Humane Society. And these were volunteers who were specifically trained to rescue people in shipwrecks. And what happened was that the wreck happened at um, like 4.15 was when the last of the 
the people were out of the um, off the boat, and they those who could climbed up the masts and climbed up the rigging, and they hung in the rigging for as long as they could. They started out with about 40 or 45 people were up in the rigging, and by the time the episode was all over, there were 28 or 29 that were still up there. Um, the fellow in the lighthouse looked out. He saw that there was a, the mast sticking out of the water, and around 6:30 in the morning, just at, at daylight, and he alerted the people in the community, the Wampanoags who lived nearby, said, "We've got a wreck out there. We've got to get some volunteers down there." So they got as many people as they could. They needed at least six people for the first boat to go out, and these gentlemen came down and volunteered, got in the boat. It took them two hours to row from the shore out to the, um, the wreck. They got out there, and these guys were hanging from the masts and, you know, frozen and frightened, and it was just really horrendous. And But they brought the little boat, the light boat, over. It was 20, 25 or 27 feet long. They brought it up near the, where the ship was, and people would drop from the masts into the water, and then they were brought into the boat. And they saved seven people. That was as many as they could take in the boat. They rowed back another two hours back to shore, dropped those people off, got another crew into the same boat, went out again. This is like almost noon, like at, you know, eight hours after the wreck or nine hours after the wreck. And they got out there and started to do the same thing again, having more people drop from the mass. And miraculously, a revenue cutter like a, the precursor to, a, to the Coast Guard, a cutter came through the sound named the Samuel Dexter, and it had like, it was a big boat, 150 feet or so, and it had an able-bodied crew and people who were very adept at doing this sort of thing, and they worked with the Wampanoags and, and rescued a number of other people. So a total of 29 people were saved, 24 by the Wampanoags, and five people made it out in a lifeboat. Um, but that's really the, the story of how um, the wreck occurred. And as I said, the only positive thing about this whole disaster is that the Wampanoags rose to the occasion and helped out wherever they could. And they became heroes. They were recognized by Congress and uh, the president, Chester Allen Arthur, uh, made mention of them. And it was a very positive thing because at the time, the, uh, there was a lot of uh, real antagonism toward the Wampanoags, and uh, it just it made them be a little bit more significant in the community. They were rewarded both monetarily and with, with little plaques, um, and it, it was a very positive experience for them. But the overall experience of the wreck was a real disaster. And what made it um, nationally known is that right after the wreck happened, like at, at 7 o'clock, the night of the wreck, um, this boat, the Samuel Dexter, brought some of the survivors and the, the bodies into New Bedford. And right away, they, that made news, and people were, were informed about it. And it, uh, people got on the telegraph, and the news went right across the country. And within a day, or uh, by Sunday, from Friday night to Sunday, um, the news was nationwide. And I, I got newspaper clippings from New Orleans, from New York, from San Francisco, from Chicago, all across the country. It was like national news, and it really made um, things, it sort of brought the world together, that here is a big event that happened, a tragedy, and this is how we need to share knowledge about it, we need to know about it. Now, <laughs> you have to take a breath. Um, we're going to take a, have a short um, break here, where we're going to listen to a reading of a poem that was written in memory or in honor of the people who were in the shipwreck. And this um, is, is, was written um, right after the wreck. As I said, it was nationally known. And Anna Marie has very generously volunteered to um, read this poem. Um, we had hoped to have music for it, but we couldn't get all of our ducks in a row, but we want to thank you very much for doing this. So. This poem was written at the time of the disaster. Uh, so we have to assume that uh, a lot of that is in here was what the public was feeling at the time. 
Uh, this poem is titled The Song of the Steamship Columbus, and it was written by William C. Atwood. The Columbus of the Savannah Line, as you may plainly see, set sail from the port of Boston to cross the raging sea. It was off the shore of Nashon, near the light of Gay Head. The Columbus foundered on the rock, and from there the news was fled. Dry goods and precious merchandise, her cargo did consist, besides those dear passengers who left their land of bliss. The moon was shining clear and bright, when all at sleep below, at half past three in the morning, they were in the midst of woe. There was a lady fair on board, came from below on deck, crying, save my baby, oh my baby, from this terrible wreck. She prayed to God above on high, their precious lives to save. No sooner was her wish denied, they met a watery grave. Men, women, and children are now slumbering in the deep. It will cause the friends of those dear ones for to lament and weep. 150 souls on board from Boston did set sail, but 29 survived the wreck to tell the fearful tale. Hard was the tale of those were saved to see the lifeless forms strewn upon the gay head shore, not so very far from home. May God protect his people wherever they may be. Likewise, that whole family whose graves are in the sea. The Farnsworth boys, whom braved the storm, the survivors list does say, they climbed into the rigging for the hours they did stay. They owe their lives to one seaman, white, a man, a sailor bold. Save us, oh, do save us, we are almost froze with cold. Tug, Storm King, and the Nelly, likewise the Dexter, too, with Lieutenant Rhodes, the hero, and the rest of all his crew. The waves were running mountains high, and winds did loudly roar, but sad to say, was stormbound and could leave and could not leave from shore. The Gay Head Indians were very brave, and history tells us so, in trying to save the lives of souls that were tossed to and fro. They risked their lives in a hurricane, as all good people said. They manned their boats like old Jack Tars and sailed from Gay Head. A word or two I want to say for the pilot, it would be best to have obeyed the captain's orders and steered her southwest by west. The captain's name was S.E. Wright, but not much right at all. <laughs> to sail his vessel on Devil's Bridge, it must have had a terrible gall. But now that noble vessel, the Columbus, she is lost. Over the briny ocean, so many times had crossed, over the briny ocean with her captain and her crew, and now she lies a reckless ship. To her we bid adieu. about the, the wreck that I thought were, were kind of interesting when I was doing the research. I, um, I went to three different sources of material. And one thing was places, one was papers, and one was people. The places, I uh, started with the Martha's Vineyard Museum, and I mentioned they have the shipwreck exhibit there, which is on until the middle of August. So if you haven't been there, it's, I, I highly recommend it. I think that's good. Um, beyond that, I went to the National Archives for information about the ship. 
and I didn't have to even leave the state, which to me is kind of impressive. We have a National Archives office up in Wal Waltham, right here in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and you can go there and find all sorts of information. And one of the, the bits of information that I found fascinating was I could get the, the shipping list, the, the lading um, papers that they call, that uh, tells how many tubs of butter were on board the ship, how many carriages, how many shoes. They had cartons and cartons and cartons of shoes. And the, sh the shoes washed ashore um, when the ship wrecked. And people all up and down Chomark and, and Gay Head uh, and West Tisbury were talking about uh, all these cartons of shoes that were washing ashore. And whoever lost them can come and get them at such and such a place. It was, it was sort of, you know, the vineyarders wanted to do what they could to help. And, you know, we, they rescued the people that they could. But then here was all this product that washed ashore. Um, so the places I went to, the Martha's Vineyard Museum, the National Archives, and then we went into the Boston Public Library and found a, a lot of information that way, which led to um, newspapers, and that's how I got access to newspapers all across the country, and found stories that, that related to the wreck from, uh, actually from the time the ship was built in 1878. They, they said it was a top of the line uh, steamship. It was written up in Scientific American and about how good the power was, how safe it was, it had all these lifeboats, it had life jackets, and how, how great it was. And then after the wreck, Scientific American went after them and said, you know, they should have had more equipment to save people, they should have devices to, save, to rescue people. It's sort of like, you know, we know that, but why shouldn't we have done it, you know? So, um, but the newspapers were fascinating, and uh, the Vineyard Gazette had, uh, still came out on Fridays in the 1880s, and every week you could find different things that were happening that they reported. And they had all the, the, the gruesome details of it, and they had the res how people rescued um, the, the people off the boat. And the, the story evolved week by week. And when they had a big presentation honoring the Wampanoags, that was a big deal in the, in the Gazette. There's one piece that's on the back, that I have on the back cover that talks about, um, that it summarizes how disastrous the shipwreck is. And this is from the Vineyard Gazette of February 29, 1884. This is, um, it says, one devil's bridge, one cold captain, one lookout who doesn't look out, and a mate who doesn't comprehend an order. And that really summarizes what happened to the ship and why, you know, it really went, went awry. It was really a disaster. And they, the Gazette summarized that, and they, the editor also apologized for having so many articles about the wreck but he said, it's a local story and it happened here and we really need to, to get into as much detail as possible. Then the other thing that was interesting in the research was talking to different people. And there are a lot of people out there who know a lot of different things about shipwrecks. And I started with this fellow in Fairhaven, um, right on the other side here, there, who um, is a tugboat captain. And about a dozen years ago, he and a group of divers went off of Gay Head and they said they wanted to find the shipwreck. They wanted to find the city of Columbus. Nobody had seen it, nobody had found it for, since it sank in 1884. So this guy with, with a group of companions went down and they found the ship. They were able to locate it. They went down and found what was left of it and um, took pictures of it. And they'd been down there more than, uh, more than 20 times, the guy has said. It's only like 35 feet below the surface, so it's relatively easy to get to. Uh, I, I had a good time talking to, to this fellow named Eric. He found, he's the one who found the ship. And then I had a good time talking to your brother, Arnie Carr, who um, is a very well-known diver, and he went down in 2005. And he found the ship by talking to Eric and getting the, the actual directions of where the, the GPS locators of where the ship is, he went down. And what's interesting about Arnie's experience, because he did this like in 2005, when he was a teenager, he was diving off the vineyard in the 1950s, and he was looking for the ship. And they went under the water there, they had a little sled, and they were, they had a sled that they towed underwater, and they kept looking for the ship. They couldn't, they never found it in the 50s, but they came back in 2005 and ended up finding it. I love that story. He was, he was great in sharing that. Um, but a lot of people that I ran into just have a, a 
good little stories to tell. There's a fellow in, in Worcester who has a collection of lighthouse paraphernalia and the Humane Society information. And how would you ever think that some landlocked place like Worcester would have you know, all this information? But this guy claims that he's got the largest collection of lighthouse material and information about shipwrecks and stuff of any place in the country. And we, we were in a little room about a quarter the size of this room, and he has tons and tons of stuff there. And he came out with things from the wreck era and pictures and so forth. It was just fascinating. And there's a fellow in South Dennis who does, who has his own little, uh, I think it's like an old lighthouse, one that's out of service, and he owns it, and he has to take care of it. And he's just very proud of that. But he's also got a lot of pictures and stuff from, from the era of the, the shipwreck. So from that, and then the other people, everyone has a little story to tell. The fellow I talked about at the beginning, who's in his 90s, um, you know, he had his stories about the, the, the panel that came off of the ship and where it came from and what that was all about. So there's a lot of tales that go beneath the surface or beyond the surface, which make it fascinating. Then, um, just, it's just sort of interesting how I started writing this book in September, and who knew that in January the Costa Concordia would go ashore in Italy, and everybody knew about shipwrecks and how disastrous that was and how careless it was and how it shouldn't have happened. And then um, I never really thought about it, but the Titanic, the anniversary of the Titanic, they made a big deal about that in uh, April. So that was just that was another little element that made the story come alive. So anyway, that's, that concludes my tale of woe, so to speak, and I'm happy to answer questions or go into more detail or talk to anyone who's interested in having a book, buying a book. Yes. Uh, two questions. Um, uh, what was the inquiry that took place and, and what changed safety-wise as a result of this accident? Okay, good questions. Um, what was the inquiry? Uh, there was a steamship uh, inspector service that went into the whole story of the wreck. Um, and that happened late in February and early in March of the same year. And they interviewed as many of the survivors as they could. 17 crew members survived uh, and 12 passengers. So they, they interviewed them. The, the captain survived, and the lookout survived, and the guy at the wheel survived. The only one who died was the second mate. So right away, you've got a little bit of suspicion there of what's going on. So uh, it was basically, I think that the rule at the time was every man for himself and women and children. You know, that's tough. But um, the inquiry found that the captain was negligent because he put the ship in, con in the control of the second mate and he was really responsible. So he lost his license. The second mate was already deceased, so that nothing happened with him. And there were, there were other findings, but basically it was just the captain that was reprimanded. Um, as far as changes, they, um, they uh, had the awards for the Wampanoags, and when they did that award ceremony, they brought out this uh, machine called the Hunt Gun, which was a little cannon that fired a line that would go over a ship that was shipwrecked that was on the shore, and the line would go up and lock onto the mast, and then people would get on the breeches buoy and, and slide off. So that was something that they were promoting at the time. It sounds very complicated. It wouldn't have worked for the city of Columbus because it was too far offshore, but the Coast Guard continued to use the Hunt gun right up into the 1950s. So that was one thing that did happen. Um, the article that I mentioned in Scientific American talked about getting flotation devices that would be able to go out to a boat and you could rescue people that way. But, um, and, and then the other thing was just what I mentioned sort of casually about the, uh, the women and children first, or last rather, that from this it seemed to be so important that nobody seemed to care about the women and children. You know, it was the, cap the captain and the crew were taking care of themselves. There was, no real element of, of helping the passengers first. So I think that it was such a shocking scene, and there were tabloid papers at the time that had these gruesome pictures of women and, and children just washed ashore dead, and you know that sort of, I think that stimulated some discussion. Yes? Where did the rescuers start out from? 
rolling to the Columbus. What, where did the rescuers start out from? Oh, they were, um, you know, where the lighthouse is at Gay Head. The um, rescuers started out from the Humane Society building, which was farther out on the cliff, right, um, so the farther base, north. At the it, no, it was up high. They had to bring the boat down from the cliff down to the beach. Oh. And the first time they got in it, it capsized, and they were afraid they weren't going to get out. They did get out through that, and then they had a second boat that was there, and that not only capsized, but it crashed against the rocks and, and went into smithereens. Mm -hmm. So they, the second boat, a, a second boat was never used because the waves were coming so strong. Um, I say that there wasn't a storm. I think the wind did pick up quite a bit, and I think it did get stormy as the day proceeded, or progressed rather. Um, but it wasn't like a storm that caused it. It was a, the wind, just the, the fetch, if you will, and the ex in, increased wind was really a, a disastrous effect. Other question? Yes? Did you come across a lot of images of the interior, like the paneling and the furniture inside at all? Photographs were not a big thing. Um, at it that era of, of, of the inside of the ship. I don't think I have any of mm -hmm. what the inside was like. I have a lot of descriptions. Right. I have people that talked about a chandelier that was hanging down over the staircase that went from the grand social hall to the second floor, mm -hmm. or to the next deck up. Right. And the chandelier washed ashore and was oh. <laughs> used by somebody, uh, Harrison Vanderhoof, took it ashore and it was, it was a gas, I think it was gas, and he electrified it, and it hung in the Vanderbilt man, uh, homestead for many years. Oh, wow. So wow. it's little things like that that are that I find interesting. All these little mm -hmm. stories. Yeah. Yes. Were there attempts to salvage her at all? Uh, were there efforts to salvage her? Yes, there was. There were. Um, there was a fellow named Tom Scott from New London, Connecticut, and I, I found just a fascinating thing about him. He was a, a called a wrecker, and he went to to shipwrecks and and salvaged them. And he salvaged 23 steamships in the course of his career, which lasted 23 years. And then there was something else that was 23. I had all these, mm -hmm. these numbers going through my head. But anyway, he was, a, he was a wrecker. And he went down there. He took the, the nameplate off the, the side of the ship that said City of Columbus. And he put it on his, uh, his office or whatever down in New London. He took the boilers. He took the mm -hmm. compass. He took. Um, several things that he was able to, to use. Um, and then they, sh they sold the wreck to the Boston Towboat Company uh, about two years later, and they were supposed to, to haul up the whole ship. I think they took part of the stern, and that was it. I do have a picture that uh, Chris Baer came across that, that showed some of the remains of the wreck that were hauled up. Um, but they did try to salvage it. I got. Um, I shouldn't tell you this, but I did. I got email the other night from one of the divers who went down in 2000, and they aren't allowed to take anything from there. But this guy found the, the builder's plate Ooh. that's on the, that was on the ship that says so and so built it in such and such a year, and he brought it up and he polished it. And you know, I have this picture that's just it's beautiful. But I can't talk about that because um, <laughs> you're not allowed to take anything from the wreck. I'm curious about the salvage. Um, operation that was pre Aqualung or pre Scuba, right? How do people salvage? How do they go down to have How access they to a do what they had? A um, there was a steam engine on a barge that um, that would they would drop something down on it. I mean, I've, I've seen a picture of how they did it, and they had divers that could go down for two stay in there for two hours at a time. Up to two hours, they had a long air hose that went down. And there's a fascinating story that I've got in here about that somebody sent me. And um, I never met the guy, but he heard that I was working on it. He, he sent me this story about a fellow who went diving uh, for the city at the city of Columbus right after it went down because they did try to get people. They thought people were still in the staterooms, and they tried to get the bodies out, and they they only came up with a couple of people. But they think there were a lot more that were. But there's a fascinating story of this guy he, who was diving and what he found when he went down. But you've got to read the book. I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Okay.
Okay, any other questions? All right, well, I want to thank you all for coming. You're a very attentive audience, and it's a lot of fun to sort of share my ideas and my thoughts and to listen to what you have. So thank you very much. Thank you.